Hello and welcome to part three of this webcast lecture about Karl Marx. We ended uh, part two by discussing the key idea of class and class struggle. Now in the Communist Manifesto, Marx says that in different epochs, the two central contending classes have had different names and were differently constituted. There was free man and serf in the Middle Ages, but these days the class struggle boils down more and more to bourgeois and proletarian. These are the two central classes with irreconcilable uh, differences. They're like protons and electrons. They would annihilate each other and they define each other and they're constantly um, clashing with each other. It's always the same story throughout history. Two classes will be locked in a life and death struggle and the state will be there either, and this is most often the case, as the actual means that one class dominates another class, um, or sometimes the state operates as a broker between the two main contending classes when neither of them is strong enough to rule in its own right. And this is Marx's view of the French Revolution. The peasants overthrew the monarchy, but they did not have the political strength to govern themselves and to entirely dominate the country. And so Napoleon arrived as a broker between the two. Um, Napoleon's independent strength, the independent strength of the state to act as a dictatorship and lord it over society was based on the fact that none of the classes in civil society could control him. Uh, and this is the idea of Bonapartism that Karl Marx in his political writing frequently refers to. Um, now then, the two classes within capitalist society, according to Marx, are the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, and we need to define those a little more carefully. Uh, bourgeois is a French word, and in the Communist Manifesto he, define, he, he describes how that comes from, the word itself means town dweller, and it comes from the medieval guilds who lived in towns and who had special rights granted by the king and how that developed into an independent power. So that by the time of 1830 and the coup that brought Louis-Philippe to power in France as king of the French people, uh, Louis-Philippe was no longer a feudal king. He was a constitutional monarch under the um, influence, under the power of his bankers who were bourgeois, uh, and the parliament that was dominated by bourgeois representatives. So that's the bourgeoisie. These are the owners of the means of production. They own, ultimately, through the banking system, all the factories, all the farms, virtually all the property in society is mortgaged and ultimately owned and controlled by the bourgeoisie. The modern capitalist state, Karl Marx writes, is nothing more than a committee for managing the common affairs of the bourgeoisie and for constituting the bourgeoisie as a class. The bourgeoisie are in a constant battle, sometimes uh, Marx is in the Communist Manifesto, sometimes open, sometimes underground, sometimes not acknowledged. And they're in a constant battle with the proletariat. Who are the proletariat? They are the landless ex-peasant, ex-peasants, the factory workers, coal miners, people with no property at all, no traditional role in society anymore, no traditional status. They own absolutely nothing. Perhaps they own the shirt on their back, so to speak, but nothing beyond that. They own nothing by the way of capital that can uh, enable them to produce their own means of life. They have to buy everything they need from the bourgeoisie. They have to sell their labour, and essentially their labour is all they have to sell. Um, they are given bourgeois constitutional rights in capitalist society, as in the French and American constitutions, and as in the constitutional monarchy of England, they ultimately even get the, the vote. But these rights, in line with the natural philosophy of John Locke, um, are not much use to them, because what's the use of a, a theoretical right to own property when you don't really have the means to do so? What's the worth of the theoretical right to freedom of speech when you do not own a, a newspaper? So this is the proletariat, and they're not to be confused with generally the poor, or, or peasants. Peasants at least own their own farm to some extent and have a means of supporting themselves and have a kind of autonomy and resistance, therefore, to the capitalist state. 
the poor, the lumpen proletariat, or simply non-historical people for Karl Marx. They play no role in history at all. But the proletariat, because they are increasingly gathered in the booming cities of the 19th century, they live together in the same slum areas, they work together in coal mines, they work together in uh, giant factories, um, are capable of constituting themselves as a class and therefore contending in political terms with the bourgeois class for control of the state. The first time that happens, by the way, in history for Karl Marx is during the revolution of 1848, the June days when the working class part of the insurgency against the um, bourgeois monarchy of Louis Philippe in 1848 separated themselves from the liberal bourgeois revolutionaries who simply wanted liberal constitutional rights uh, and demanded positive action by the state to create national workshops to provide jobs for all the unemployed. So you can see how that is a very different set of political demands. These are proletarian political demands to use the state to organise the economy and take it away from the bourgeoisie. Very, very different from the revolution of 1830 in France or the first phase of the revolution in 1848, which was the now familiar um, liberal demand for constitutional rights, a free trade, the private ownership of, of the economy. The proletariat failed in 1848, the, the rebellion of the June days when they erected barricades to keep the national workshops open and to effectively inaugurate a socialist reorganisation society couldn't happen because uh, the, the proletariat at that time was very small in relative terms in France. Uh, and secondly, uh, they didn't have proper political leadership. They hadn't understood um, the what they were up against essentially uh, and had um, were suffering from all kinds of uh, what Marx would have thought of as delusions that by joining in with the liberal demands for a better parliament they could get their needs met that way. They had failed really to have what Marx calls class consciousness and understanding that they must destroy and overthrow the bourgeois liberal state entirely and supplant it with what Marx calls the dictatorship of the proletariat. Nevertheless, Marx thinks that the proletariat throughout the 19th century uh, is the class with the most revolutionary potential for moving the whole of humanity towards a kind of ultimate freedom, uh, towards the Hegelian idea of uh, recreating the Garden of Eden. So Marx has that idea, but what he's saying is Engels is right, I'm sorry, Hegel is right about that. Marx is kind of saying society should evolve towards a new Garden of Eden on Earth but that's not in some heavenly realm, that's right here on earth. And the people who are most capable of creating that are not the bourgeoisie, and certainly not the feudal monarchs, perhaps not even the peasantry, whose idea of a perfect society is just to have their own little farm and a few cows. But the idea of creating a new paradise on earth, the people who can do that are the proletariat. And they can do that on behalf of the whole of humanity, because they are the people, as it says in the Communist Manifesto, who own nothing. They have nothing to lose but their chains. Furthermore, the proletariat is completely international. If you're a coal miner, it doesn't make any difference whether you're down uh, in the bowels of the earth in France or Germany or Brazil or China or anywhere. So the proletariat, because they own nothing, um, really are a non-national class. Uh, it's the bourgeoisie who are very keen to establish uh, ownership within national units to create the idea of the modern romantic liberal national state. The working class, the proletariat, have nothing to gain from that idea at all. Ultimately, all it, ultimately that romantic nationalism ends up in war, war between France and Germany. Um, and in those wars, the, the best option really for the proletariat is for the workers or the proletariat in Germany and in France and throughout the world to all join together and overthrow their respective bourgeois rulers rather than uh, killing each other. And with those remarks on what Karl Marx sees as the need of the proletariat to constitute itself as an international class, workers of all countries unite into one formation, we end this third part of this webcast lecture about Karl Marx.